feels like the refs always miss calls against the Pelicans, right? Well, you're not wrong if you think that, and I've got the numbers to back it up, plus what the Pelicans can actually do about it. It's Tuesday's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans in NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, the guy who hates it apparently when Garrett Temple breathes and Pelicans insider Jake Madison at NOLA Jake on Twitter. Here with y'all on this Tuesday fun show, we're going to talk about the refs. We're going to take some questions as well. Are the Pelicans truly one of the deepest teams in the league. And then I've got something about expectations and how they're changing for New Orleans right now. And a bonus question for y'all in today's episode. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday for y'all available completely free wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube as well. In today's episode of Locked on Pelicans brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. The intro there, the Garrett Temple thing, joke from Reddit. I saw the picture. It's funny. Thank you all for not making me Toby from the office. I'll take being Michael Scott if those are the two options there. But I said good things about Garrett Temple. I don't have a problem with the minutes that he's played the past two games with all the injuries to everyone. And even with him getting 17, almost 18 minutes against the Phoenix Suns, there's not much you can do when you're down three starters and then Dyson Daniels, who's another guard. You, you just need a warm body that is around guard height to throw out there on the court. And right now, that's Garrett Temple. Plus, he made a couple of threes, even if his plus minus was really, really bad. And it was. But we're not going to talk about him anymore. We're going to talk about the refs. Feels like they're just screwing over the Pelicans, right? It feels like they're just missing a lot of calls. I've had a lot of y'all ask me, why wasn't that a take foul on Najee Marshall against the Clippers? Like, how wasn't that? Someone explained it to me. The explanation is the refs screwed up. Like, that's the explanation. There's not really anything else to it. They just screwed up. That happens with referees. But it feels like this happens a lot for New Orleans. For a team that likes to get inside and score at the rim and in the paint, they're 25th in free throws attempted. Zion is 46 in the league in terms of getting to the line per game. Those numbers feel low, right? It feels like some of these guys are getting hacked. They're just not getting calls. You've seen Zion complain a little bit. You've seen CJ McCollum complain a little bit as well. And it doesn't really lead to anything. Though Zion in that game against the Clippers at one point really thought he should have been fouled, glared at the refs. It was a sideline inbounds. They give the ball back to Zion. He immediately scores and then they call the and one, which he then made. So that's good. But the numbers bear out that the refs, yeah, don't really seem to like New Orleans just based on that. But look, if you're a jump shooting team, if you take a lot of threes, and maybe that's what's going on here because New Orleans is shooting well from three. They are, I just lost the numbers here. You know, you have Trey Murphy who's taking a lot, who's one of the uh, lead leaders in three-point percentage. In terms of three-point percentage, they're second in the league at 40%. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just a jump shooting team. Brandon Ingram loves the mid-range. CJ McCollum loves the mid-range. But that's not it. That's not the case at all. Here are the numbers. The Pelicans are, drumroll please, third in terms of shot attempts in the restricted area. So basically at the rim, they're number three in terms of shots in the paint, but not in the restricted area. They're eighth. They're ranking in one of these categories in the top five and then the other, the top 10. These guys, this team takes a lot of shots at the rim, close to the rim, where it's usually big men in Zion. Maybe Jonas too. But when you're getting shots at the rim, there's often a lot of contact. Just bodies, arms flailing. And we've seen that the NBA officiates bigs differently than they do guards. You, at, If you're a big man, you need to deal with way more contact than you do if you're a guard where they'll call touch fouls. And they don't do that against big men. It's just kind of how it goes. But when you see those numbers, third in the restricted area, eighth in the paint, it doesn't add up to 25th at all in terms of free throw attempts. That is a number that is wrong. And that tells you right there 
that the refs are screwing up. If you wanted to be justified in saying the refs hate this Pelicans team, I'm not going to go full on conspiracy of like the NBA is doing it, this stuff's rigged, whatever. But the refs are clearly missing things and don't really know how to officiate this Pelicans team and seemingly have forgotten how to officiate Zion Williamson. He was getting to the line almost nine times his sophomore year. He's getting to the line half that, four and a half times per game. That number should be closer to eight, to nine, than what it is currently. That isn't going to get it done if you're a referee. You're, you're, you're doing your job wrong. He has not changed how he's played. And in fact, he's actually getting to the basket or going to the basket more so than he did his sophomore year when he was getting all NBA votes and was an all-star player. So what can they do to fix this? Shoot more threes. Yeah, it sounds a little crazy, right? That sounds counterintuitive, but shoot more threes. The Pelicans are 28th in total three-point attempts. This is something that an NBA player told me, Eric Gordon, but let's just call him NBA player, when I watched a game with him at a watch party at Tracy's one time. We were watching the Pelicans play the Rockets. It was a one-game road trip. He was out injured and stayed back and came to the watch party and you know, met with people, chatted with people, and then sat down at a table with us and watched the game, and we asked him questions, and I talked with him a lot. And it was really interesting. One of the things he said with James Harden out there, the reason James Harden gets so many fouls when he's driving to the basket is because that court is spaced so that the refs see contact very easily. They're not missing things because there's not six bodies down there, five bodies down there. It's literally James Harden. He's already blown by his defender, and then there's a help defender, likely a big down there. And when that big fouls James Harden, the refs can see it because there's no like sight lines being obstructed. So if the Pelicans want to space the court for Zion, not just to give him more room to operate and make it easier to score, but better sight lines for the refs to be able to see him. You're not going to be able to give a press conference or scream at the refs in terms of getting them to give you calls. It's just not going to happen. David Griffin did that open season press conference after Zion had broken a finger that was on a rebound, not actually getting hacked down low and not having the foul called. You don't want to go into a situation like that because it's not going to work. And you, frankly, I'll probably just make fun of you for it on here because it's not true. It's not open season on Zion. They're just missing calls. Make it easier for the refs to see the calls with their eyes you do that by shooting threes pulling defenders out of the paint making teams pay for throwing so many bodies down there this was kind of a flip side that I wasn't totally expecting to see I thought they would be getting calls but I've said you don't space the court for Zion because they're always going to collapse on him because he's such a threat to score at the rim until you start making those well now that you're shooting 40 percent from three take more take more than 28th in the league in terms of how many they're taking. Now, it's gone up a little bit since um, Zion was out and Brandon Ingram is out, but that might change when he comes back. They're taking just under 30 three-point attempts per game, 29 this season. Needs to be higher than that to really start to space that court. And then the flip side is the Pelicans will start getting foul calls. I promise you that's the case. So the key to getting more foul calls, shoot more threes. Counterintuitive, yes, I know. That comes from an NBA player and other people around the league because that theory is something that has stuck with me. Um, it's not even theory. That fact is something that has stuck with me for a very long time. So coming up, are the Pelicans truly one of the deepest teams in the league? But is there enough consistent bench scoring to make our deep run into the playoffs? The answer might surprise you on this one. Let's talk about that coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Before we do that, though, today's episode of Locked on Pelicans is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Hiring for your small business can feel, feel like a high stakes wager. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available so that you make the best hire and reduce that risk. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. You don't want to leave a position open. It's costing you money. It's putting more work on your other employees and it's just going to harm your business. So post your job on LinkedIn jobs and add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. And simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and then hire. And it's while small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnMBA 
today. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday for y'all like no one else is, breaking down everything you want to know, giving you insight you don't get anywhere else, like the thing about the free throw shooting. And now for your second listen, go check out Locked On Sports today. The biggest stories around all sports, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. So we just went over the free throws, which I think is important. Shoot more threes. Like it's that one's just kind of simple to fixing a lot of things. So with two days off before the next game, I said, let's open up the the show to a mailbag on Twitter. And y'all came through. And so a couple people kind of asked about various questions about the Pelicans being actually a deep team. Are they the deepest in the league? And I don't like to get into overreaction six games in to a season there's still a lot of noise in the stats there's injuries this team is dealing with they're a deep enough team I don't think they're the deepest in the league yes they were able to get a big win over the Clippers who are supposedly one of the deepest teams in the league but you also saw them completely fall apart against the Phoenix Suns it really just depends on who's out no team even the deepest in the league is going to be able to survive when three starters and one key role player are out Those guys really struggled in those roles. Then you are getting tons of Garrett Temple minutes. And while I don't fault him for playing or Willie Green for playing him, it's not like those minutes were great beyond the two threes that he made. So no, you don't want to look at this and be like, oh yeah, they can compete with anyone on any given night. They can't. The theme of yesterday's show talking about the win was that with Zion back, the role players just kind of fell right back into their roles and did what they needed to do and were much more comfortable because of it. So there is depth there because I do think the role players, and that's not a negative thing to say about any of them, they're good at their jobs. They're good at what they do. Yeah, there's some, you know, does that mean they're deep in a sense? Yeah, they're not, you know, we're not convincing ourselves of Dante Cunningham. Some music just started completely playing here and I have no, oh, thank you, basketball reference. My goodness, that scared me. I'm sorry if you heard that. Uh, (laughs) We're not convincing ourselves that Dante Cunningham is like an all-star or a good starter here, right? We're not convincing ourselves that Solomon Hill is worth the $52 million, truly $48 million. There's a funny story behind that one day, I'll tell. So all of that is to say like, yeah, if you have guys that are great at their roles, you're a deep team and they're capable of stepping up when they need to and in in doses, but it's not going to work every single time. So I wouldn't look at this team as saying like, oh, if they lose guys, you know, next man up mentality, they're always going to win. That's, that's not always going to be the case. You certainly want those top guys there too. And then the role players playing well off of them, I think is great. Najee Marshall being one of those guys right now because he's been awesome. So the next question is then, is there consistent enough bench scoring to make a deep run into the playoffs? Or would you need to flip Kyra Lewis Jr. or Devontae to get a consistent scoring of someone like Jordan Clarkson? Y'all are obsessed with Jordan Clarkson. And to be fair, he's having a great season so far. So I, so I understand it. So here's the thing. And I've said this, and I think we even did a show on this, and I talked about it with Will Guillory of The Athletic when he was on the show, right? They don't, they don't need that role. If you have that guy, sure, it's not a bad thing to have. But the way they're using their rotations when healthy, Zion and CJ coming out, leaving BI out there, and then BI comes out and Zion and CJ come back in, it's never like you're going to give Jordan Clarkson time to just go be the man with a second unit. They're just not running their rotation that way. And even if you trade for Clarkson, it's probably not going to be that either. So I don't really worry about consistent enough bench scoring because the bench doesn't need to do like that much. They need to make some threes, but you don't need a dude off the bench that's averaging 20 points per game and in the running for six man of the year. There's enough depth at the top end, having three guys that are capable of being the dude, him, the man on the team. So I think they're fine. I think the depth that they have is perfect for what they are. It does fall apart when one of those big name players goes down or, or two of them, certainly. But I think that would be the case for, for any team. And there's very few teams that are really going to be able to survive with two or three starters out. So I don't truly think it's ultimately that big of a deal if they don't have that guy. If they want to do that trade, if you trade for Jordan Clarkson and send two guys out, you're doing it to consolidate and create a roster spot. Maybe to sign EJ Liddell at the end of the season or to 
do another trade or just assign someone in free agency, though I don't think they there's really anyone out there you'd particularly like. I don't think anyone's that interested in Dwight Howard, even if you want a defensive big off of the bench. I don't know if Mo Bamba is realistic. I've seen a number of people ask me about him. So when you look at the bench, I think they're good because they're good at their roles, not because they're like amazing players that are starter level guys that are just chilling on the bench, waiting for their shot or just buried because they're in a bad situation. They're just really good at their roles. And I think that's important and sometimes even better because it means they play off of those stars perfectly. And that's what you've seen in this four and two start to the season for New Orleans. And speaking of that four and two start to the season, let's talk about that and expectations plus a bonus question about national media. It sounds like I'm losing my voice here. Coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. And thank you for making Locked on Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday for you all breaking down everything you want to know about this team And it's been a fun ride so far. It's not going away anytime soon either. Hopefully they continue to be good with a big game coming up against the Los Angeles Lakers. Oh man, you really want to win that one, don't you? And now for your second listen, Locked On Sports today. Seriously, it's just the one-stop shop if you want to catch up on the biggest stories in all of sports. Didn't watch Monday Night Football? They'll talk about it. Missed a couple of the NFL games over the weekend, they're going to have a recap there for you. When Zion goes off, they bring me on that show to talk about it because it's the biggest story of the day. Whatever it is, that's what they're talking about over at Locked On Sports Today. Lost, if you needed an acronym. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. So Pelicans sitting at 4-2. and two. This is fun. This is also very different than last year. It took 21 games for the Pelicans to get their fourth win of the season. They've already done it in six. That is an incredible turnaround for this team. Adding Zion to it, the growth of some of these guys too that really started to show it in that playoff run last season. And it was an incredible Sunday. And this comes from at Talent Stats. The Saints and the Pelicans both won On Sunday, fittingly for a Halloween weekend, it was the 13th time both teams won on the same day. 13th spooky number. It also marked the 20th anniversary of the first uh, of the Pels first game ever. Pretty cool statistic. Only the 13th time they played on the same day and won, which I don't know if that's like a lot or a little, but it feels like a little given the history of the this basketball franchise being in city for over 20 years at this point. Pretty cool to see. It's one of those things that makes you want to like not take it for granted, but also not get ahead of yourself. There's still a long way to go in the season while New Orleans looks good and they do look good. You know, they still struggle against the Jazz who who are up 20 points in the fourth quarter on the Memphis Grizzlies as I'm recording this. You know, they've struggled at times against the Phoenix Suns without people, but that game, I don't know if that would have changed big time for them, even with some of those guys in with the way the Suns were playing, but who knows? It's still a long way to go. It's not always going to be this this sunshine and happiness that we're experiencing right now when it comes to this Pelicans team. So keep that in mind. There's going to be losses. It doesn't mean we need to burn the place down, especially early on in the season. I've seen some people really upset. I've gotten a couple people DMing me some really angry things about Willie Green and the rotations and all that. They're four and two. If you're winning, you're doing something right. Your players are doing something well. Keep that in mind. There's going to be rough patches. There's probably at some point going to be a three game losing streak in there and it will be okay. This team is still in a good position, and if you're trying to project them forward, looks to be making the postseason not just in the play-in tournament. I can't promise they're going to finish as a top-four seed, but things are looking good for this franchise, especially when you put it in the context of last year, and I think that's really important. They're still figuring things out. They're still growing. They shouldn't be peaking six games into the year. You want to see that for the final quarter of the season. So you're looking 60 games in. We want to see them playing their best. There's still room to grow. There's still room for Willie Green to improve, but how he's navigated these injuries and finding right lineups that have worked and just kind of gotten wins. I don't have many complaints about everything. The only real complaint I have is the refs. And that's what we talked about in the, in the first segment of today's show. So hopefully they continue to to do this and continue to win because the future still does look really bright. I'm still really excited about what we're seeing from this team. So final question before we wrap up here. 
And this come, I, I'm not going to use the Twitter names today. Why does national media feel the need to push the narrative that Brandon Ingram is going to be upset with his role and it's not a good fit alongside Zion? So one, I haven't heard that. At times you see people say that, and that was before the season started. But in terms of like talk on ESPN and all of those other places, I haven't heard that. And that's partially because I don't pay attention to that stuff. Because they don't know what they're talking about in terms of like in-depth minutia around teams like I do or even you do around these Pelicans teams. They don't know as much about the Celtics as John Corrales, my co-host on the Wednesday episode of Locked On NBA, which you should listen to tomorrow. He knows better. So if I have Celtics th things, I go and listen to him. Same thing for the Kamenetsky brothers with the Lakers. Is there truly an issue with Russ? Is it truly as bad as people make it out to be? I want to know from the people covering the Lakers that do it on a day-to-day -day basis. And if they're saying these things, it doesn't matter. It has no impact. I, I, I always tell people, find the coverage you like, you trust, you like to listen to, watch, whatever it is, and focus on that. Who cares about some of the other stuff in the noise because it does not impact anything. Even when y'all, some of y'all were upset with me for reporting on some of the stuff around Zion last year, didn't impact anything. It didn't drive him away. Sign the extension, right? It shows you, you know, my role exists to make this more fun for you, to make it more enter entertaining for you, to add some depth to what you watch out there on the court. I don't actually have like the power that people really think I do. I wish I did. I'd be betting like crazy if I could influence things to that degree, make a million dollars really quickly and then hand the show off to someone else. But that's not how it goes. So if you don't like what the national media is saying, don't worry about it. Stick here on Locked on Pelicans. There's tons of other places to get Pelicans coverage too. Some of them, most of them are excellent. So focus on that. Don't worry about what the national media says because we're the people covering it here on a daily basis. And I don't mean that to sound self-serving, even though it kind of is. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Pelicans. More questions of yours tomorrow, so if you've got some, leave them in the comments down below on YouTube as we'll get you set for the game coming up on Wednesday against the, or Wednesday, that's tomorrow. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm off on my day. I'm recording this Monday night. It's the Tuesday show. Um, I, got, I got turned around. So one more, one more day of mailbag questions. They'll play that night. Then we'll recap the game on Thursday. So that's kind of the rundown for part of the rest of the week and then get you set for the weekend with games against the Warriors and then a quick back-to-back -back against the Atlanta Hawks. So that's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Pelicans. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter, and I'll be back with you all tomorrow.